the real, I told uh, Connie, the real person you need to hear is my wife, so you're going to have to have her come back. because She's got a far better story than I've got. How many are survivors? I'm just curious. How many of y'all are survivors? Look at that. How many are fighting right now? Okay. Um, for me, um, I'm going to tell you this, and I don't want you to think I'm crazy. And, and do me a favor. I'm usually used to being mic'd up. I'm not one of those yelling pastors. I usually speak real quiet. So if I go down, y'all just let me know. I'll bring it back up. Um, cancer, for me, was not an intruder, but an instructor. And I can honestly say cancer was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me. Now, I know some of y'all are saying, what? So I'm going to try to give you my whole story, and I'm going to try to give you the two great lessons I learned. There was a lot of lessons I learned, but I'm going to try to give you the two great ones. I was uh, going to St. Mary's Hospital to visit uh, some people that we had in there, and while I was on the interstate, my stomach started to swell. And I thought maybe it was just a bad breakfast. But then the, the skin started to stretch. So I knew something was not right. So I told my wife, I called her and I said, Honey, something's going on. I'm going to go visit the people at St. Mary's. Then I'm going to go downstairs to the emergency room. So I went into the emergency room after I did my visits, because that's what pastors do. Um, and they kept me overnight. And that was my first introduction to go lightly. And... There's nothing go lightly about go lightly. And um, <clears throat> so they were going to do that overnight and then do a colonoscopy the next day. They said, we just think you were impacted. We don't think it's anything serious. We're sending you home. And uh, in the next couple of weeks, you've got an appointment. You're going to meet a, and have a colonoscopy. So I had to do it twice, that go lightly stuff. And when I got out of the colonoscopy, the doctor took me back to a room and closed the doors and all of us know the first time we heard it you have cancer that was when they were going to tell me um i had no symptoms i had no idea the doctor told me this type of cancer had probably been in my, in my body for about 10 years they could tell that by the growth they didn't know why it took so long it actually if it had grown down i would not be here today but it grew this way and it grew a long time this way before it started going out and I remember my wife crying, my two girls crying. They were trying to smile, but they were just sobbing. And so I knew it was bad. And so what I did, I just asked the doctor. I said, okay, where do we go from here? He said, we're going to send you over to this. They sent me to regional. They do some more tests. He said, we haven't done the biopsy yet, but we know for sure this is cancer. I know what it looks like. When we got to the hospital, they said, you're in stage four. And I was like, how is this happening so fast? Um, they didn't waste any time. I was in surgery in less than a week and a half. They had done all these things, and I didn't even have time to process everything. They took out 14 inches of my colon. They took out, I think it was 28 different lymph nodes. And because of where my cancer was, they couldn't do radiation. So I was getting ready to do chemo, and we go into the oncologist and the oncologist says we're not going to do chemo we think you might have just been stage one but that was a roller coaster and I don't know about y'all every time I had to go back to get the blood work done just to see what the numbers were all those fears came back and I'll be honest with you that's where my cancer journey began and God taught me two really powerful lessons through that and he's taught me some more since my wife has had it we're going through our our second journey and, and instead of her taking care of me I'm trying to take care of her and and ladies be patient with us men we're not good at that y'all are like wired for that we don't know what we're doing we're dumb and so just be patient with us and <clears throat> but I want to share a verse that helped me um, this is a passage from John chapter 9 and Jesus and the disciples are walking, and they see a blind man. Y'all are probably very familiar with this. They see a blind man, and the disciples ask a question, and this is the question they ask. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus' answer gave me a lot of help and hope with my cancer. This is what he says. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this has happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. 
When I was in the hospital, everybody that I talked to later and people that were in the hospital has a different response to cancer. The, the number one question I heard was, why me? Or why now? And then when we're going through the chemo and all that, the question is, why is this so hard? When is it going to get better? Uh, some of y'all ask this question, when is my hair going to grow back? I've been asking that since 18. It's never, <laughs> never come back. And um, what I've learned during this time and, and through that passage is questions are very powerful things. They direct the way we think. And Henry Blackaby, who wrote Experiencing God, says if you ask the wrong question, you're going to get the wrong answer. And so when, when I got cancer, and I don't, other than apart from the grace of God, I didn't ask why and all that. This is what I really asked myself. God, how are you going to use this? Um, I, was, I had a peace that God gave me. Uh, I had some other things happen in my life the next year that I struggled with. So I do know what struggle is as well. But I just realized questions are powerful. Do you know who asked the first question in the Bible? Satan. And it was to direct Eve's thinking to a wrong answer. Do you know who asked the second question in the Bible? God. And it was to direct them to right thinking. And so when we have cancer, one of the best things we can do is ask a right question. Young people come up to me and ask this question all the time. Well, what's wrong with it, Pastor? They're asking the wrong question. Because I already know they're trying to justify something. And I, this is what I throw at them, a different question. Let me ask you another question before I answer that one. What's right with it? And that stops them in their tracks. Some of the questions that I try to get people to ask now that are going through cancer is, what, here's the question. God, what works are you going to display through this? That's a good question. God, how are you going to use this in my life? God, how are you going to use this in other people's lives? How are you going to... Work this for a greater good. Doesn't God give us a promise? I will work all things together for a good. And so I just asked the question, God, how are you going to use this for a greater good? Cancer taught me about the goodness of God, about how to trust in God. It taught me about the faithfulness of God. It taught me really how to be honest with God. To be angry. To be upset. But most importantly, it taught me about God himself. Job, after his struggle, and his was a satanic attack, and he had all those health issues, at the end of his struggle, this is what he said, my ears had heard of you, talking about God, but now my eyes have seen you. He said, I, I knew about you, but after all this, now I, I know you. So the two things that God really taught me, and I'm going to try to stay on task. Connie said I could go as long as I want to, but that may get in trouble. Um... <laughs> God used cancer to soften my heart to relate to other people. When we've been untouched or haven't gone through some hardship, sometimes it's hard for us to empathize and know what people are going through. When we have a lady in our church who's a very dear lady, she's very young, she lost her husband. He had Lou Gehrig's disease and, he, and, and he's gone. And she's trying to figure out how to do the rest of her life. And my wife is a widow. She's lost her husband. And let me just ask you this question. If I go and tell her all of God's truth and tell her it's going to be okay, is that as powerful as when my wife tells her who's been through it? My wife does a lot better job at that because she's telling them the same thing I'm telling them, but they're hearing it from somebody who's been through it, and they can look at her and say, you know what I'm going through. The pastor doesn't have a clue. God tells us that he is the God of all comfort who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 1. When I was in the hospital, I had a pastor's visit and he came and he knocked on the door and pastors are weird people. They don't really, yeah, they are. They're weird people. And so when he came in, this is how I thought, oh, this will be good. I'll see how other pastors visit people. And so he sat down, and I, I couldn't make this stuff up. He sat down, and 
he said, Larry, Brother Larry, I just want to come and check on you, see how we're doing. We're going up to Charlottesville to go visit my cousin. Oh, what's going on with your cousin? Well, she's got the same cancer you, you have, and she's not going to make it. That's how the visit started. And I thought, did he really just say that? And then he started telling me about all the stuff they've been through. And, and there was part of me going, yeah, you need to stop. This isn't, this isn't helping. And then I saw it on his face. He was like, oh, crud. I realized what I've been doing. And he tried to switch gears. Oh, but that's not going to happen to you. You're fine. You're fine. The visit for me was done. How many of y'all had visits like that? Or can't? Yeah, look at the hand. Me and my wife said we could write a book, 101 yes. Things People Shouldn't Say to Someone with Cancer. And I think they just struggle because they don't know what to say. And they're trying to be encouraging. But boy, was it discouraging. And I remember looking at my wife and saying, honey, and I did. We're weird people. I was taking notes. Don't do this. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do because when I go to see somebody with cancer now, I want to lift them up, not discourage them. I had the two best encouraging visits, and I can remember both of them were done by people in a very short amount of time. The first one was a lady, she was a Christian lady. She came into my room, and she did this is how long the visit went. This is exactly what happened. She came in and said, Larry, I'm not staying long. I want you to know something. I love you. I had exactly what you had. That was 20 years ago. You're going to be okay. And she went. I went, Phew. that's what I needed. That's what I needed to hear. The other one was from a father who I had I'd grown up with his son. I hadn't seen him in decades. And I wish I could show you the picture. It was a picture of a truck that had gone over a guardrail and landed on a drainage pipe. And he had two pages that were stuck together. My father brought it to me. He said, he said, Jimmy wanted me to give you this. And that was the first picture. And it said, God isn't done with you, dot, 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 dot. And I flipped it over, and it's the big picture of the truck on the drainage ditch. And it looks like it's on a thousand-foot cliff. There's nothing under him. It was a bridge. And the truck had landed there, and if it hadn't, it had been all over. And on the second page, he wrote, until he's finished with you. He's not done with you yet. That stays in my office. We've moved our house. I packed those pictures up nice and neat, and they're in storage. Because those pictures got me through. And what I realized, especially you survivors, um, y'all have the ability to encourage people with cancer far more than you know. Just by saying, hey, been there, done that, and I'm doing great. We need to be reminded that God can, is not only able to heal, he can heal. And listen, doctors only give predictions. God's the one that writes the last chapter. And so I tell all of my people that God, we, we quote this first, but do we believe it? God can do exceedingly what? Abundantly and above all that we can imagine. He surpasses anything we could. And so we need to be praying. And so I tell all my people, please get as many people as you can praying. That encourages them. We send out texts, hey, I'm praying for you. Hey, how's it going? I'm praying for you. I've got a friend that just found out he's got stage 4 colon cancer. And, and he called me. Why did he call me? I've been through it. He said, Larry, you've been through this. I, I just need to know what's going on. And so I'm checking with him all the time. He's getting his port put in on Wednesday. He doesn't know this. I'm showing up. I'm going to be there. I want to encourage him. And so God taught me the power of encouragement. God can do what doctors and others cannot. I'm not saying don't go to the doctor. You need to go to the doctor. But I, and I did. I thank God for my doctor. But, but cancer taught me how to be a good encourager. The big lesson God taught me was God is faithful. We say that until we're in a bad spot. And I don't know about y'all. When things get a little dark or God gets a little quiet... We say he's faithful, but let's just be honest for a second. Do we feel that? Do we struggle with that? How many of y'all know the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir? Does anybody listen to them? There's a song that, they, that she wrote, it's, and it's called God is Faithful. He, is, he has been faithful. Let me just read the words to you. It says, In my own suffering, through every pain and every tear, 
there's a God who's been faithful to me. When my strength was all gone, when my heart had no song, still in love, he proved faithful to me. Every word he promised is true, and what I thought was impossible, I've seen God do. And when my heart looked away, and many times I could not pray, still my God was faithful to me. There's a verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that says, When we are faithless, he is faithful. Aren't you glad his faithfulness isn't based on our faithfulness? She goes on to write, The days are spent so selfishly reaching out for what pleased me, and even then God was faithful to me. Every time I come back to him, he's waiting with open arms, and I see once again he has been faithful, faithful to me. Looking back, his love and mercy I see. And though in my heart I have questioned, even failed to believe, yet he has been faithful to me. What most people don't know is she wrote that when she was doing her own battle with cancer. And she, and she learned that God is faithful through all those things. I, I, we sing a lot of hymns at our church. Um, two of those hymns, It Is Well With My Soul and Great Is Our Faithfulness, were written in the shadow of some bad things. And yet God is faithful. The Bible says, For great is his love toward us, and, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. I'm just going to read these Bible verses to you. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all the generations. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty. And your faithfulness surrounds you. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God. And he is faithful. Those are all just verses put together about God's faithfulness. And he is faithful. And often I know in my hindsight I can look back and see everything God did. But when I was going through it I was saying where are you? What is going on? And what he was doing was building my trust and my faith in him. This is what God taught me. And he still teaches me this. My wife has got a really aggressive form of breast cancer. They caught it early. And she did chemo. And God was faithful all through that. She didn't miss one day of work. It's not true for everybody. She, my wife's short, but she's feisty. She's like a chihuahua. She's short and feisty. And she's, she's a strong lady, isn't she? And, and we were trying to slow her down and she wouldn't. They had two ways to do radiation. She could do that radiation where they, um, you know, shoot your radiation in that area. Or they've got a new procedure now where they put the pipes through your breast. Wow. And you go in over a weekend. And she chose that one. Because she's feisty. She said, I don't want it to slow me up. And she, and she did that. She did it real quick. It was a long as a weekend. I think it was a week. But um, she did all that like a trooper. But the type of cancer she has, they've got to deplete the hormones out of her body. And that's been a ride for us. That's been tough. And there's been days both of us have been going, God, where are you? Why is this so hard? You're asking the wrong question. What God really was doing in our life was asking us this question. Larry, can you trust me? Beth, can you trust me? That's a tough question. And what God has taught me throughout my entire life is God is continually coming to me saying, can you trust me? And I'm going to be honest with you as a pastor. A lot of times I come back and I go, I don't know. And God says, do you remember what I did here? Yeah, I remember that. Do you remember how I showed myself strong here? Yeah. Do you remember how I got you out of that mess you put yourself in? Yeah, I remember that. Do you remember how I took care of the cancer? Yeah, I remember that. Do you remember how I helped you with your back surgery? Yeah, I remember that. Do you remember how I saved your life with your gallbladder? Yeah, I remember that. Can you trust me? And I'm like the man in the Bible. Yes, Lord, I believe. Help my what? Help my unbelief. God says, trust in me. He comes and said, his word says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. We all know this verse. In all our ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. And what the Lord really does is he's come to me many a time and says, Larry, can you trust with me with all your heart? 
and lean not on your own understanding. Can you just acknowledge me and I'll make your path straight? Can you do that? And so the great thing about cancer is it's taught me to know about God. Through the bad times and the good times. My wife, when she got cancer, I'm going to finish with this. When she got cancer, God was already making plans before we knew. We counseled a married couple and they came into our home years and years and years ago. And it was in a bad place and we couldn't help them. And it kind of imploded. But we made friends with both of them. The little girl that came in, I won't say her name because I want to protect the the innocent there, but she became just an adorable adopted child of ours, if you will. And when we were getting ready to start chemo, we did not know it, but God did. She worked there. She had a friend who she loved and knew would be good for my wife. And so she said, hey, I need you to do me a favor. Can you work with best schools? And she's like, sure. You're going to love them. They're great. Okay. So she goes, and she was. She was wonderful. This nurse was absolutely wonderful. See, God is faithful, not just to my wife, but he's faithful to this little girl who doesn't know God. And doesn't know, not sure if she knows God. They get it off, and they're getting together a well. And during the process of chemo, what we didn't know about this nurse was her and her husband had been trying to get pregnant and really were having a hard time. And she's pregnant now. And she's just waiting before she tells everyone. And so her and my wife are real close and all that, and then we go in, and she's not there. And if you've had chemo, how many of y'all had chemo? You get close to the people that that work with you. And we've gotten real close to this girl. And she wasn't there one week and she wasn't there the second week. We're like, what's going on? And they weren't supposed to tell us, but we're kind of, we're in the niche, I guess. And they, they tell us she lost the baby. And that's when we found out she'd been trying to get pregnant. She was pregnant. She lost the baby. And when she came back, she was just devastated. You could see it. She was wearing it on her face. What she didn't know was my wife had been pregnant with twins with her first husband. My wife's a widow. Um, He died from complications from Crohn's disease. And they had been trying to get pregnant and couldn't. Finally got pregnant, got to five months, and she lost both of them. And so they shared that story, and they connected. Now, my wife is spicy like a chihuahua. And so my wife does this. You know what, honey? We're going to start praying right now. That God's going to be you. But you know what? God's going to be you, okay? And I'm a pastor. I went, whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, no. We're, we're not God. We can't make that decision. You can't tell her that. Don't. And I got in the car and said, honey, you have got to stop doing stuff like that. And she said, I just know it. I can feel it. And I'm thinking, your feelings can betray you. You can't go off your feelings. Two weeks later, she was pregnant. And at the end of our chemo, we got to hold that little baby. And God comes and says, can you trust me? I'm faithful. I'm not going to let you down. We're going to walk through this whole thing. And if you will let me, I will display my works in such a way, you will be blown away if you can just trust me. So I think the question that we all need to be reminded of, and the answer we need to be reminded of, the question is, can we trust God? And the answer is yes, because he is faithful. So I don't know where you are in your struggle or what you're dealing with. I'm 10 years cancer free. And if I get it tomorrow, you know what God's going to say to me? Can you trust me? And hopefully I will go, yes, Lord, I will trust you. So as we close out, let me pray for y'all. And uh, I want to thank all of y'all for doing this. This was wonderful. Thanks for letting me come. My wife really is the better speaker. We need to have her back. But let's, uh, let's pray. I'm going to pray for y'all and pray for what we're going through. Lord, we just want to thank you that when we walk through dark places, you were with us. And when you seem silent, that's when you're the closest. 
And what we struggle with is remembering how faithful you are. Father, we can trust you. And I pray that you'd help all of us to trust you with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding that no matter what we're going through, that you're doing a work. Your ways are higher than our ways, and you're not just dealing with stuff with us, but the nurses around us and our oncologists and the doctors and our family. And, Father, this cancer that has come in, you're going to work all of it to a mighty good. And if we would just stand still and, and see the salvation of the Lord and see your hand work, we would be awed that you use us the way you do. You're a good and gracious God. And you show yourself strong on behalf of your children. So we just pray for each person here, not just for a healing and a restoration of their body and their health, but that we would be very sensitive to what you're doing around us. And then maybe one day we too can say cancer was the best thing that ever happened because we got to know God far more than we ever would have without it. We thank you, Father, for being so faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Thank you all.